Dorian Chong is Deputy Director, Curatorial and Chief Curator of M Plus, a new museum of visual culture that will open its Herzog and de Moron design building in 2020. Okay, I'm not sure if this needs to be updated, but Dorian, you will tell us more. I know the pavilion is already open in Hong Kong's West Kowloon Cultural District appointed as the inaugural chief curator in 2013. And Dorian has discussed some of his early projects with us and also his vision um, as a member of the M plus team leading a team of several, several um, eminent and younger professionals. So it's really wonderful to see uh, what Dorian has been up to all these years, really behind the scenes, building infrastructure from bottom up and yet also thinking again about these aspects of where the visual culture of Hong Kong can be brought to the fore and can be in dialogue and debate with so many parts of the world, considering also the turbulence that this global city is going through. It's really commendable uh, what has been achieved on the ground by this team. Dorian's exhibitions include uh, the Mobile M Plus Live Art, Sunken Va, The Infinite Nothing, Hong Kong Pavilion in Venice. He's worked with Samson Young. He's worked also on this excellent show, Noguchi for Dan, uh, Dan Wo, Counterpoint in 2018. Um, and yeah, we look forward to all that he has to share with us today. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that introduction. Um, I uh, trust that you can all hear me. Uh, the very first line of the introduction where you said um, that the, our M plus building is supposed to open in 2020. Uh, yes, that is correct. I think my bio needs to be updated and I think I can address that um, during my uh, presentation over the next half an hour or so. Um, but echoing all the panelists uh, up to now, I would like to echo uh, my thanks for the invitation, uh, Pratik and Priyanka. Thank you again for bringing us together. Um, and thank you again, Natasha and the experimenter team. Um, so I guess without much further ado, I would just go right ahead and try to attempt, attempt to share my screen to show a little presentation. I hope that's visible. Can somebody tell me whether my PDF is visible? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I uh, pulled this together relatively quickly and I didn't quite have a title. Um, so at the last minute, I just thought Maybe that could be the title, what I and others have done in the last five years. And the reason why I say in the last five years is because I guess uh, for this um, 10 year anniversary uh, of Experimenter that I am representing the class of 2015. And, um, and I was thinking back to that experience of just all packed together in that lovely gallery in Calcutta, um, myself and other presenters, um, but just uh, you know, dozens of people who were intently listening for a few days. And my presentation at the time was um, in the first part, um, what I think is a very corporate presentation of this project that I'm part of, um, a mega culture cultural district building project called West Kowloon Cultural District. And plus is one of the cultural institutions, um, you know, a kind of a boilerplate presentation that I had already been doing quite a lot as a big part of my job. And I remember seeing the um, audience's faces and then they uh, seemed very intrigued, but at the same time had this expression of um, sort of dubiousness or suspiciousness, you know, because it sounded very, very corporate, um, as I admitted. Um, in the second part of my presentation, I sat down and started talking about my own uh, personal curatorial history, uh, uh, talking about several very meaningful exhibitions to me 
um, prior to my experience of working at M plus in Hong Kong, uh, two main institutions in the United States, uh, which was the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. At that point in 2015, I had been in Hong Kong only for just a couple of years. So I was just still new at my job. Uh, but now five years have passed. So I have been working on this project now for seven years plus. Uh, we were planning to uh, partially open the museum by the end of this year, which means next month. Um, but of course, COVID-19 has um, put uh, restrictions and delays on um, what we are doing. Um, oh, hello. Sorry, did I lose the connection? No, am I still here? Okay. Yeah. So the, muse the museum opening has been now delayed uh, by until fall next year, fall 2021. Um, in Hong Kong, what we're experiencing is that uh, we've had, uh, because we started the, the experience of this pandemic early, we've already had um, what we call here three waves. Um, just today, uh, the, the health ministry here is uh, saying that there will be a fourth wave that is coming. Um, the city has been in pretty much uh, close to the outside world. The border has been closed, so we are very much in the uh, trapped in this island. <laughs> so quite a surreal situation, but the work continues. Um, despite all these restrictions and disruptions, the construction on the building has now stopped. And while we had three bouts of working from home each month and a half uh, each, but um, we never stopped working on this project. So I thought what I would do is to spend a bit of time just updating on uh, yeah, what has happened in the last five years on this institution building project, because that's essentially what my curating work has been. So speaking of the institution, um, and, and I am doing this intentionally, uh, next few slides are going to be again quite, in, uh, quite corporate or institutional, uh, but this is again really big part of what I do. So for those of you who had already seen it before, but for those of you who have not seen anything um, about M+, um, this is what we say about this museum building project. Uh, it's a new museum dedicated to collecting, exhibiting, and, and interpreting visual culture of the 20th and 21st century. This is extracted from our uh, vision statement. Uh, it's a global museum in and for Hong Kong shaping a preeminent collection um, uh, and the 20, of 21st century visual culture within an Asian con context, broadly Asian context, with a distinctive voice that reflects the uniqueness of our time and place. Um, so really describing what the museum is, what the vision is to ourselves, to our immediate stakeholders, as well as the, our international network of colleagues is really a very important cornerstone of what we have been doing over the last um, almost 10 years or so. Now, the building, um, even though why we always say that the muse uh, museum is not just the building, but building is a very important piece of hardware. So I was just uh, saying that I recall including um, a version of this image in my presentation five years ago that shows um, this master plan of the cultural district project. So what you see here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this hammer shaped piece of land was created by reclamation about 20, actually 25 years ago um, in Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. Um, this is the largest uh, land reclamation project in that last 20, 30 years. Um, and then it was uh, after much discussion um, was decided that it was going to be a mixed use uh, development. About 40% of the land uh, developed is uh, for cultural institutions, another 40% uh, for commercial development and the remaining 20% a green space. Um, so you can see M plus is situated um, in that um, square shaped over there. 
this is the rendering of the building that Natasha was referring to, designed by Herzog and de Meron and selected in the architecture competition that took place in 2013, um, just before I joined the project. And here's a diagram that shows uh, the building um, that the, uh, most of the galleries are contained in the podium level, which is the second floor. And that is just to give you a sense of uh, the physical sense of the physical scale. It is 110 meters by 130 meters. So on that second floor is contained about um, 13,000 square meters of gallery spaces and additional exhibition and display spaces on the ground floor and the basement. Um, and the rest of the building contains other functionalities such as our learning and education center, moving image center, um, and library. And of course, our offices, retails, and food and beverage spaces and whatnot. And the total building is a 65,000 square meter building, which also includes our conservation and storage facility, a separate building adjacent to the museum building. Um, the land uh, and the district looked like this uh, when I first arrived around 2013. Um, I don't know if it is, can you tell, but the, uh, the, the, the district is basically that the part that is right in front of that, that tall tower, which is called International Commerce Center, um, which is the tallest building in Hong Kong, one of the top 20 tallest buildings in the world. That was before anything was built in the district. Um, 2015, when I was uh, part of the Experimenter Curators Hub, uh, we had just broken ground. Uh, the building started looking like this around 2017, I believe. Um, I think when I was in Calcutta in 2015, we were saying that we we're going to open by 2018. Certainly that was not enough time. Um, so yeah, that's what it looked like around 2018. Um, yes, uh, again in 2018, um, but it uh, continued apace and that's what the facade of the, the building uh, looked like about a year ago. And that's what the building looks like now, pretty much complete. And uh, we're just doing our final fit out of the building. Um, and, and again, as I said, a few minutes ago that the, we were very fortunate that even though there has been sort of these mini lockdowns um, several times this year, construction never stopped. Um, and it, uh, but of course it had to slow down and, um, you know, in reduced capacity, but that the work continued. So we're really looking at moving into our building um, quite soon within the next couple of months. Um, so that we can start the work to open the museum by fall 2021. So I've said all of that um, in my first 10 minutes of presentation to give a little update on what that part of the institution building project is. So um, you can imagine that that takes up a lot of my time um, as a museum professional, as part of the museum management, um, but also even as a curator, uh, building is a big part of my job. But I'm often still asked by other professional colleagues that uh, this question, what project are you working on? Um, and of course, I think what that means is that what exhibition are you working on? Um, and sometimes I answer that, well, my project is to really to work on building the museum and also manage other curators. Um, but sometimes I understand why this question is asked because exhibition making is such a, a core part of what a curator does. And I still have curator as part of my title. So speaking of more recent project, I should really speak about this exhibition or actually it's two exhibitions that I contributed to working with the artist Shirley Tse um, it, um, on the left in the image here. Um, Shirley is a Hong Kong born artist who has been based in Los Angeles for a long time. Um, also a professor at CalArts and um, Christina Lee, who's a uh, wonderful Amsterdam based independent curator. Um, I work with these two individuals on uh, 
the Hong Kong presentation at the Venice Biennale in 2019. And plus has been tasked with uh, Hong Kong's participation in the Biennale over the last four editions. Um, and, and my contribution is really working as a, an institution the institutional and consulting curator for this ongoing series of exhibitions. Um, we're very lucky to have this wonderful um, pavilion right in front of the entrance to the Arsenal, uh, featuring a very nice courtyard. Um, and here is an installation view of Shirley's exhibition last year titled Stakeholders. And then this is the interior view. So the exhibition consisted of two large installations. The first one was called the play court in the courtyard. And this work was titled Negotiated Differences. Uh, the first work uh, put together existing sculptures uh, from her previous uh, exhibition in Los Angeles. And this particular work called Negotiated Differences was made um, for this exhibition. Um, 2019 was quite a momentous year uh, for all of us, but especially for those of us in Hong Kong. Um, many of you um, may have heard or even follow closely uh, what the city had gone through. In the second half of last year, the city was embroiled in um, a series of protests, um, some of them quite quite violent, actually. Um, so that's what we went through before the onset of coronavirus, at the beginning of this year. And you may also recall, though, uh, after a whole series of protests and um, like unsettling situation, what we experienced in Italy was the historic Aqua Alta. Um, so what we had to do just two weeks before the end of the exhibition in beginning of November is to send our team, our um, art installer, assistant curator and registrar to close the exhibition and save the artworks um, um, early on. So here's actually quite lovely picture after a day's work of our team um, in Venice. Uh, but that was just, um, how should I put it, a cherry on the... <laughs> uh, on top of a, a cake. Um, it was a quite an intense year. Now, what we do for each edition of our Venice participation is to bring the exhibition back to Hong Kong in what we call Venice Biennale Return Exhibition. So we did that in this little space called M Plus Pavilion, which uh, includes about 300 square meter of exhibition space um, that you can see uh, beyond that glass wall. And um, so we uh, plan to open this exhibition originally in early June this year. Um, we had all of the works shipped back from Venice, as well as additional elements that Shirley uh, and her assistants made in Los Angeles, uh, shipped from Los Angeles to Hong Kong. All these parts that uh, constitute uh, the um, that sprawling but also evolving and mutating installation of negotiated differences. Now, this particular work consists of about 900 pieces. About half of them are these spindles that, that she had put, uh, she um, made by wood turning. Um, this very, um, of course, ancient sculpture technique that she taught herself, she taught her assistants. Um, and the other half of about 900 elements are 3D printed connectors. So these pieces are put together uh, with a little um, um, uh, you know, predetermined plans in response to the space. And um, these spindles and connectors are basically put together and then prop themselves up by gravity and by balance. There's no fasteners other than that. There's no glue used. And each time it is responsive to the space as well as the people who are handling them. The original plan was for the artist uh, to come here with the two assistants that she has worked with for a long time um, from Los Angeles and the curator to fly in uh, from Amsterdam for a three week long installation. But what has happened during the COVID pandemic is that none of them could fly into Hong Kong. 
um, I mean, they could, but they would have been subjected to two week quarantine. And as an institution, we were not uh, able to secure insurance for them. So um, it was a very long discussion at which that none of, us, none of us could take that risk. So what we had to do is um, a very intense series of Zoom conversations. And here is a screenshot of our art installers on the right side, uh, working with the artist assistant on the left side, being trained for almost two weeks to figure out how to put this work together. And given the time differences, because we're in three different time zones, um, surely in surely in our assistance in Los Angeles, which is 15 hours behind Hong Kong, and um, Christina, the curator in Amsterdam, six hours behind. Um, so what we had to do in order to put together this exhibition is for Shirley to be with us from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, installing the piece by her looking at these four surveillance cameras installed at four different corners of the exhibition space. Um, and then there she goes to sleep around 2 p.m. our time. And then Christina will come on and then we will install with her for another few hours. Um, and then at the end of our work day, then they will send um, a whole lot of photographs and videos of that day's installation to both of them so that they can comment and give us further instructions. So an interesting experiment, which I suspect that many of our colleagues are doing in the current um, situation. And that resulted in an adaptation of that exhibition from Venice in our pavilion. Um, now the exhibition was delayed by about a month. So we opened on July 1. By the way, July 1, of course, is a, a very important date for Hong Kong. Um, July 1, 1997 was uh, the day that Hong Kong was returned to People's Republic of China from the British rule. Um, and in this year, particularly, that's when the national security law was introduced. Um, so that was uh, coincidental, um, but it just took on a whole different level of meaning um, for the exhibition. The exhibition, um, after just a few weeks, had to be shut down because we were experienced at the uh, we experienced at the time what we call third wave of spreading infections. Um, so it was a shutdown for a month and a half, and then we were but fortunately able to open for the last month. Um, so and it concluded just on November one. Now, so this was the most recent project that I contributed to in terms of the exhibition. But exhibitions, of course, um, has been going on uh, for M plus, even though our museum building has not been open. Natasha referred to M plus pavilion earlier. Um, and this last exhibition with the Shirley Tse happened there. And that was actually 11th and last exhibition that we did in that little space that we thought of as a little laboratory. Um, a little bit, little training ground for uh, us curators, um, as well as our colleagues, registrars, art installers, conservators, to practice before we move into the museum building, which will have 50 times the exhibition space. This little space opened back in 2016, um, little ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, these kinds of official ceremonies are very important part of us as, um, a publicly funded uh, massive project. And since then, um, we were able to put together a series of exhibitions. So I just thought that I will have a little walkthrough of that history. Um, in addition to that latest exhibition of uh, Venice Biennale return exhibition with Shirley Tse, we did the two others with the two previous Venice participations, artist Zhang Kinwa, um, and Samson Young were presented in the pavilion. We did a series of exhibitions that show different aspects of the permanent collection that we have been building for the museum. Um, so this was an exhibition called Shifting Objectives uh, back in 2017 that highlights our growing design collection. 
um, we did an exhibition called Ambiguously Yours, a Gender in Hong Kong Popular Culture. Um, and the Hong Kong cinema, pop music, especially from its golden age from the 1980s and 1990s is an important aspect of our programming as well as collection. We did an exhibition called Canton Express, uh, which we realized for the first time um, since 2003, um, this uh, a major part of the exhibition called Zone of Urgency, curated by Ho Han Ru as part of the 2003 Venice Biennale. And that big chunk of it is part of our collection. So we conserved and represented it in this exhibition. We also did an exhibition in 2018 called uh, Weight of Lightness um, that highlights our ink art collection. Um, ink art is a very important artistic medium in this part of the world, especially Hong Kong as a, a hub of modern and contemporary experimental ink. We also did an exhibition last year um, in, no, actually still in 2018, excuse me, um, exhibition called uh, In Search of Southeast Asia through M Plus Collection that brought together um, art as well as design and architecture collections that are focused on the region of Southeast Asia. Um, Natasha, in her introduction, also kindly referred to this exhibition called Noguchi for Yanvo Counterpoint, where it brought the work of Isamu Noguchi and Yanvo together. Um, and our penultimate exhibition was called the uh, inaugural Sig Prize exhibition. Um, uh, in honor of uh, Dr. Uli Sik, a, a very important um, a donor uh, for M Plus and who was the founder of the Contemporary Chinese Art Award, founded it, uh, established in 1998 and for 20 years, a very important um, sort of catalytic uh, platform for artists and critics in mainland China in this um, very critical evolutionary years of contemporary Chinese art. Now that segues to Another aspect of my curating work, which is uh, building a collection with a group of curators. I was just referring to Dr. Uli Sig, and here he is um, standing inside a uh, 2016 exhibition that we did uh, before even the pavilion was opened, um, highlighting some of the iconic works from the collection that he gave to us. And that donation consisted of more than 1500 works of Chinese contemporary art from the late 1970s to the early 2000s teens that he gave to M plus this fledgling institution because he felt that this collection that he put together to document the history of this really remarkable phenomenon um, needed to go to a public institution and he felt that M plus in Hong Kong was the institution to, um, to take care of it in perpetuity. So I would just quickly um, click through some of the iconic works um, and the C collection now called the M plus C collection is widely considered to be the premier collection in this area in the world. Um, because it contains these early iconic works by uh, uh, works like this, including um, uh, by artists Zheng Fan Zhe um, and Zhang Xiaogang. Um, and here's another exhibition view that shows uh, some of those iconic works from the early er early period in the late 1980s and 1990s. Um, so. In terms of the collection building, so we went from zero to over 1500 works in one fell swoop, um, but uh, we had to build on top and around that core collection of Chinese contemporary art over the last eight years or so, because the vision of this institution is not just Chinese contemporary art museum, it is actually a museum of visual culture that encompasses international art, um, international design and architecture and moving image. Um, so as extensive as this collection is in the area of Chinese contemporary art, there were other iconic works that we needed to add to such as Yang Fudong's Seven um, Intellectuals in Bamboo Forest, um, a really uh, a groundbreaking work of moving image. 
Um, and then I will just show some of the other examples that we have added over the years. Andreas Gursky's monumental photo of the HSBC building in Hong Kong. Um, the whole set of editions that document um, the performance pioneer, Xie Le Qing's uh, one year performances uh, from the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. Japanese postmodern designer uh, Shiro Kuramata's uh, sushi bar called Kyotomo uh, is a whole architectural interior that we acquired, quite an infamous uh, and controversial acquisition that we made um, six years ago. Um, yeah, and then I would just uh, also add that uh, I earlier mentioned the ink art is a very important medium for us. So here's an example, uh, Hong Kong born experimental uh, ink painter, Irene Zhou's work. Um, it's an early collage work by Yayoi Kusama. Um, we also added um, this uh, now quite well-known and internationally shown work by Isaac Julian, 10,000 Waves. Um, the work that was shown at Haus der Kunst a few years ago, um, this beautiful installation by um, Sarah Tse. Um, Indonesian painter Christian I. Joe's work. Uh, we were also lucky to get a group of works by Nalini Malani, inclu including um, this early experimental film, Utopia, from the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, series of works by Munir Farman Farmayan. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just go quickly, just in the interest of time. Um, yeah, just we'll mention the names of uh, Mona Hatoum's sculpture, um, Shanta Ackerman's um, last uh, video installation that she showed in Venice in 2017. Um, series of experimental films by Anna Mendieta. And another celebrated acquisition that we made was an almost complete archive of the work of Archigram, the experimental British architecture group. Um, so uh, quite a bit of a coup for us. Um, so yes, um, building the building, uh, building a curatorial identity for the institution through exhibition program. Uh, building the spine of the institution through building a permanent collection. All of those are uh, critical parts of building a permanent institution. Um, but, uh, and of course, I'm not doing this all by myself. Um, you know, a big part of what I do is to uh, manage, but also support and really help a group of curators, um, dedicated, talented curators coming from various places. Um, and I just decided to call this little section hands because all of these images, by the way, um, I was able to pull together very quickly from this uh, the book of photos that we are putting together um, um, called The Making of M Plus that we are planning to publish for the opening of the museum. And it was a sort of a very nice uh, trip down the memory lane looking at um, all the collective work that we have been doing over the years, even before the museum building is there. Um, and looking at those images, there are just a lot of gestures and hands that are, <laughs> um, that, um, that really speak to the work that we were doing. And here's the early days um, with our very analog floor uh, model, uh, the gallery model, where myself and the other curators are trying to figure out how to display our evolving collection. Here's Leslie Ma, our curator of ink art um, during uh, what we call teacher's briefing for every single exhibition that we have done. We have brought more than 100 primary and secondary school teachers across Hong Kong to tell them about um, our program. Here's Pauline Yao, our lead curator of uh, visual art, giving a tour of uh, her exhibition called The Five Artists, A Sites Encountered, talking about a work by Korean artist Lee Bull. Here's on the left, uh, one of our curators, Lee Chok To, um, who's curator of Hong Kong Film and Media, speaking with Anne Hui, um, a celebrated filmmaker from Hong Kong, who also won 
the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Film Festival um, earlier this year. In fact, um, we had organized her retrospective a couple of years ago, and here um, they are in conversation. Our curator of architecture, Shirley Surya, is presenting at an architecture conference in Berlin a couple of years ago, talking about the museum and the district building project. Um, but of course, this is now the reality of how uh, we have been doing our work. Um, the, uh, the, all the senior curators um, having their curatorial meeting on um, our, uh, we use Microsoft Teams, um, which is, has been our meeting room. And Iko Yokoyama, our lead curator of design and architecture, um, uh, doing conservation check on one of our recent acquisitions. So all of these hands literally doing different kinds of work, presenting, brainstorming, um, discussing, um, touching artworks and um, design works. These are, of course, the hands that are building the institution um, in its first decade, even before it opens. Um, yeah, so uh, all of this work, of course, is essential. Again, working on the building, working um, on our exhibition and curatorial program, building a collection and um, planning and preparing for the opening of the museum and what it's going to show in its first year and beyond. Um, so while uh, overseeing and orchestrating much of this work of curators and in, in uh, at M Plus, we have um, in the curatorial team more than 30 people, in the learning team more than 20 people, um, and the curatorial department includes also those who work on digital and editorial content. That's another 20 people. So it's already a team of almost 70 people out of close to 200 people. It's already a very large institution. So really the vast majority of my time and, and brain space goes into just keeping um, the ship afloat and moving forward. But um, the thinking more in terms of content curatorially and intellectually, of course, is a critical part of keeping the mind fresh and alive. So in the last section, I thought, um, I just thought that I would just call it load stars. Um, the, a few very important, um, um, artists who have been uh, guides as well as uh, co-passengers cool in this journey um, for me. And, and then I often think about, of course, the artist Huang Yongping, who passed away about a year ago uh, prematurely. And he had been a, a very, very important inspiration and intellectual guide for me as an individual curator. And this is an image of his awe-inspiring installation that he made um, as uh, part of the Monumenta program at the Grand Palais in Paris a few years ago, titled Empire. Um, and here's an image of 15 years ago that when I was lucky to be able to work on this first survey exhibition of his work at the Walker Art Center. Here's an artist, part of the first generation of Chinese contemporary art, uh, who moved to uh, Paris uh, soon after his participation in Magicien de la Terre um, in 1989, and spent the rest of his career really thinking about the meaning of globalization, the legacy of colonialism and imperialism, and the uh, irreconcilabilities or reconcilabilities between civilizations. So he had been um, a very important um, intellectual spine uh, for this particular curator of my generation, um, an artist that I have been able to work again and again um, together has been Yan Vo. And here during his um, during the installation of that exhibition, Noguchi for Yan Vu at the Amplis Pavilion. Um, and through him, because this is what Yan does, that it's not always just about his own practice, but his practice is a portal to other people, other artists' ideas, other cultures. And what he introduced to me is uh, somebody that I knew, I thought I knew quite well 
which was the figure of Isamu Noguchi, um, the Japanese American um, sculptor, artist, uh, designer, landscape architect, um, who really cultural crossing and um, hybridity that um, is very much early 20th century and mid 20th century. Um, and, and, you know, but also a figure who connected uh, the, the unlikely constellation of figures from Brancusi to Chibai Shu to Martha Graham to Buckminster Fuller and Louis Kahn. Um, and, and then figure who really sort of struggled with the, that, again, that idea of cultural um, irreconcilability uh, and reconcilability in his own practice. And that uh, introduction led to us being able to uh, work very closely with the Noguchi Foundation in New York to bring some of the um, very historical works like this work from Stra uh, called The Strange Bird and a whole set of galvanized steel sculptures, late work, uh, quite remarkable body of work that is less known but in fact, um, really summarizes in many ways um, the innovation of Noguchi's work from the early 1980s. And then third and final artist that who has been a lodestar star for me um, to uh, sort of you know help me continue to be a curator has been um, Hegyu Yang, somebody that I have worked with multiple times of studying back in 26, 2006, 2007. Um, again, back in Walker Art Center. And then the project that I've been engaged with uh, for a long time has been writing this ongoing dictionary of ideas and techniques and phenomena in her work. Um, and then this is a writing that I first started uh, for her first American solo exhibition at Red Cat in Los Angeles. And here's the sort of opening title page of that publication called A Small Dictionary for Hegyu Yang. Um, and, and then she uh, asked me again and again over the last few years to update the dictionary the second time for her solo exhibition in Strasbourg um, in 2013. So um, the second edition was written and published first in French for that exhibition and for her very recent solo exhibition in her home city of Seoul then I wrote the third edition of the dictionary. Um, so this is my last image. So very quick walkthrough of, yeah, like what curating means to me, which over the last four years or so has really been about um, just, yeah, like a really institutional administrative and bureaucratic work. Um, that is not to say that there isn't pleasure uh, or um, rewards in that work because we uh, really building a permanent institution is once in a lifetime kind of a work and privilege. Um, but where do you carve out and maintain that space where you continue to have conversations with artists um, has been, to be perfectly honest, challenging. Um, but um, I'm glad that I have been able to manage to do a little bit of it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dorian. I have a few questions, um, but in this case, your presentation was extremely comprehensive, so some of them <laughs> answered. Um, so I'm going to start by taking uh, questions from our audience. Okay. Starting with Naeem Mohammed, do you know? Uh, hey. Who says, Dorian, you use the phrase land reclamation. Cultural uh. institutions are sometimes brought to revive an area. The M plus site looks like barren land. But in other situations, the arrival of arts institutions can accelerate displacement of people from housing, as we know, through gentrification. Mm. Arts institutions work to repair the harm of possible gentrification by subsidizing lower income housing in the area or some other solution that combines progressive economic policy 
with cultural institution building? I'm s uh, okay. I'm not quite sure to be perfectly honest if I got the first, uh, the second part of it, but I would first say that to uh, clarify land reclamation, um, I always wonder that the, uh, the term reclamation is a really interesting one because that land of almost 40 hectares didn't exist at all. So it was, you know, uh, it's a landfill basically. Um, and then it's a land that has been created um, by, you know, um, by filling the ocean. Um, in fact, uh, Hong Kong is very inhospitable terrain for any kind of construction. It's highly, very, very mountainous. There's a very few, um, a very little areas where you can easily build. So historically, since the British arrived um, in the mid 19th century, then the, the areas around the water, especially in Victoria Harbor between Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon Peninsula have uh, been filled um, to create lands where you can build ports and of course places for residences and whatnot. Um, so it is not, uh, you know, if I understood the question correctly, that it's not a repurposing or gentrification of the land, but it's actually land that was created. Um, what has happened uh, since that piece of land was created almost 25 year years ago is that there is now a moratorium on reclamations, especially in Victoria Harbor, which of course is a very important economic engine um, in terms of tourism and whatnot. Um, that it, the, historically that harbor was much, much larger, but it has gotten smaller and smaller through the historic reclamations that our um, project is the last one to have happened uh, in that part of the, the city. Um, but I didn't quite catch the, the second half of the question from Naeem. Naeem is asking whether arts institutions should work to repair the harm of possible gentrification by subsidizing lower income housing in the area or some other solution that combines progressive economic policy with, in, with cultural institution building, especially in complexes like this, where there is a collaboration with the city and agencies that, act, that could perhaps mm. take up. Yeah. I think that is perhaps a long-term goal. Um, I think it, what perhaps Hong Kong as a city um, has to figure out, I mean, like, you know, this is actually a question that is not just related to, to this particular project, but, you know, it, it's related to its overall economic model in general. Um, it is, you know, a city with, uh, that is known around the world as uh, the most expensive, that has the most expensive housing. Um, it is a city that is still now debating whether uh, the, um, the minimum wage should be raised or not. Um, and the, the city that is, of course, infamous for the so-called cage homes, where this tiny little apartment is a subdivided into literally cages where the, the manual laborers live in. So I think that the city uh, government, of course, has a lot uh, uh, to, uh, to resolve for many years to come. Now, um, this mega cultural institution building project uh, is, is that uh, is the consideration of uh, the reinventing the model, the economic model of the city. You know, of course, Hong Kong is, is a mercantile city, the city that has been built for trade purposes for all these years. Now, um, Hong Kong was the economic engine for all of mainland China when China was first uh, uh, liberalizing, when it was opening its doors in the late 1970s and 1980s. Now it is not anymore. Um, we are just one of many you know, uh, financial centers. Then what should Hong Kong be? Um, and I think part of the economic uh, planning is for it to be a cultural city. Uh, now, the... the uh, culture being instrumentalized for cities or nation's economy or tourism and whatnot. Um, is, that, is that the case here? Yes, of course it is, you know, like we will be too naive to not recognize that. So 
you know, we are part of that, the um, economic planning for the future. So in that sense, the whole question about what should the city do to, um, uh, with regards to gentrification and perhaps worsening disenfranchisement of the city population, I think that is perhaps the next step that, that we have to really participate in. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll take up two questions now. Um, one is by Niyati Dave, who asks, how have you pivoted your exhibition strategy in response to COVID lockdowns? In a post-COVID cultural landscape, do you think there will be, still be room for the need to build beyond physical exhibits to explore innovative, immersive digital formats for engagement. And it might be interesting here to also mention the digital initiatives that M Plus has already undertaken, even before the pandemic. Um, and Mo Sat is asking about the process of collection building and whether M the M Plus curatorial team has been researching in Asia and Europe or whether the collection is mainly built up from large format exhibitions such as biennales and triennales. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, I think not just us, but all cultural institutions, but perhaps the, the pressure is more for larger institutions. Um, what is going to be our digital alternatives, compensations, or parallel strategies? Like this is a question that I think everybody's asking. Um, digital pivot is often what people are saying that I mean, when people cannot come to your physical spaces, then you have to compensate for um, you know, continuing to provide content um, uh, and ideas to your audiences. Um, you know, without sounding uncollegial, hopefully, or um, critical, that I think that uh, all, all of us in the, the museum business, I think, are still grasping <laughs> what, what that digital alternatives or digital pivot looks like. Um, everybody has jumped on the bandwagon of uh, publishing on YouTube or doing Zoom webinars and whatnot. And we also have jumped on, on that bandwagon as well. In a sense, we're lucky that our, the museum building is not open yet. So we don't, we're not compensating yet. We're just a building a block, uh, a build, we're just creating a building block of the institutional foundation as well. But so I think what we have to all collectively figure out in the next year uh, and maybe even going forward is that um, is digital space and what we do digitally truly compensating? Because I don't think so, in fact. Uh, the online space has become, in fact, much more treacherous space. And that's what we're seeing in political spaces as well. So to go in there very naively, uh, that uh, believing that that is just still a democratic space, I think is dangerous. But I really have the sense that, that I think all of us um, museums and cultural institutions uh, are yet to develop that, that maturity. So we talk about this a lot, <laughs> about what the ethics are, what the financial strategies are, what the dangers are, what the risks are. Um, but uh, I think we're like any other museums really trying to figure out, um, yeah, uh, what, the, what the strategy might be. And I think, um, and that, that I don't think that we should really make assumptions that that participating, participation or expansion are necessarily the right answer. Uh, sorry, and then Mo's question was about how do we do our um, collection building? No, of course, we, we don't just um, acquire works from the large scale exhibitions from Biennale or, or you know, I mean, that's um, like, I guess I would imagine that for most museums, the biennales and large scale exhibitions are just one of uh, many venues in which we get to discover. Um, but how we further discover and acquire 
uh, works are of course based on various forms of research. Um, and and you know, curators until this year have been traveling quite extensively um, through us, I wouldn't say all over Asia, but certain parts of Asia. We also work very closely, of course, with galleries in our city, in our region, but also other parts of the world. Um, sometimes we uh, cannot just rely on galleries, so we go directly to the artists. Um, so it's a very multi-pronged approach. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's questions from Lily, Lily Chung. Um, yes. And also Mario de Souza, who have similar uh, question for you. Uh, Lily has been following, of course, the developments since she attended a recent Archigram Symposium. Um, mm. They're both wondering in terms of the Ulysses collection and choosing M plus instead of Ch a Chinese museum to donate the collection. Yeah. Also to make sure that the works are not censored, subsumed or edited. And as Hong Kong faces struggles for self-determination mm. and various forms of everyday resistance as well as battling the pandemic as we all are, um, while carrying out this kind of struggle for democratic values or existence as such yeah. as, as a plural entity, you know, what, what are the strategies? And uh, Lily goes so far as sort of wondering whether there are contingency plans for third country safekeeping. <laughs> yeah. All right. So first of all, uh, Uli uh donation was based, was the realization of something that he had said for many years, even before the donation happened, which was that, that he was building this collection um, to return to China at some point because he wanted to build a documental record of the historical phenomenon. After, of course, observing and waiting for many years, then he felt back in 2012 already that in any foreseeable future, the only proper public institution that will be built uh, will be in Hong Kong and that will be M+. Um, and I think that is based on the different um, the uh, sort of the, the legal system and the governance structure that the city has from the rest of China, um, but also uh, because Hong Kong had, has always been an international city for long. And, and already back in 2012, it was experiencing that almost the beginning of the explosive growth of the contemporary art world. Um, you know, with Art Basel coming very soon and then the, the galleries are setting up shop and all of this. So all of those forces together, he felt that M plus is the right institution to take care of them. Now, the big part of what we do as institution, as part of institution building is really set up structure. Um, and, and here I'm not talking about just building, I'm not just talking about curatorial program, you know, I talked about these different sections. Um, I wasn't going to bore everybody with the, um, the, the kinds of legal structure that we had to set up um, for the institution. And one thing that we worked very hard on in the first few years to set up a trust um, that oversees the collection. So we don't own the collection. Uh, the cultural district doesn't own the collection. The government doesn't own the collection. Um, it is protected by the trust that is tasked with um, protecting this permanent collection for the beneficiary. And the beneficiary is people of Hong Kong. Um, now, um, the, the given the, what would you call it, unsettling development that has happened in the last few years, uh, not last few months, I should say, um, that then, then do we need to really think about the, whatever, an exit plan or contingency plan? Um, no, we're not thinking about that at all. Um, I think that this is a fluid evolving situation. Um, we didn't, of course, nobody could have anticipated that things will unfold in this way, but um, I don't think where we are um, 
this sort of unpredictable situation that we are in is not just in Hong Kong or China. I think it is all over the world. <laughs> I think that we are really facing unprecedented challenges uh, that the, none of us could have anticipated all around the world. Um, so we feel that the best we can do um, is to continue to really do this, this um, really uh, rigorous work of building uh, the procedural legal uh, infrastructure building um, that is based on the legal system um, that is specific to Hong Kong that is also evolving. Um, so uh, I think that actually it will be a form of dereliction of duty if at this point we're talking about the collection needs to move to some other country. <laughs> I think that will in fact be uh, um, the betraying exactly the trust that we were talking about, uh, which is that we have built this institution first and foremost for the taxpayers of this city. Thank you um, for that. Um, Rohit Goel has a question, um, which I'm just going to summarize. I mean, you also went through these specific artists um, like Hei Yang and Yan Ho, artists that you have returned to um, and maintained a relationship with in that, in the way that it also informs your own kind of curatorial thread. But could you tell us a little bit more about the collection building practices that you yeah. wish to institute? Um, you know, what has it meant to have also this range of moving from cinema to, mm. um, to popular culture? Again, the city as a protagonist in, a way, in the way that it informs the collection building process. If you could give us some lines of argumentation from your end, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I very quickly mentioned at the top that the three areas, which we call actually disciplinary pillars for the institution's program and collection are design and architecture, moving image and visual art. Um, we think of these as three overlapping circles that create a kind of a very complex Venn diagram. Um, there are these three discipline, disciplinary pillars, but there is also cross-disciplinary thematic area, which is the fourth area called Hong Kong visual culture. Um, so how we uh, envision this collection is that, um, and that the reason why we call the museum visual culture museum is that, that these are, I mean, you know, in a sense, the, the, our collection areas are not revolutionary. Um, that when the Museum of Modern Art was set up in the late 1920s and early 30s, they were already looking at architecture and film from the very beginning um, of its development. Um, in the 70s, as the Sancho Pompidou was being set up, those other disciplinary areas that are critical in, in in modernism was also very much part of it. So we are actually very much uh, descendant of the museum building legacy. Perhaps one difference that, that that we have introduced is to think of it as a visual culture rather than calling ourselves as an art museum um, that, that we're saying it's a visual culture museum. And then that is in part responding to that pronounced hybridity as well as the less formed nature um, of these different disciplines in our part of the world um, compared to other Western metropolises. Um, now, out of that hybridity, out of that uh, very dynamic melange of uh, less formed disciplines is that unique, uh, uniquely recognizable visual or popular culture that people all around the world recognized from Hong Kong, whether through its cinema, whether it's a pop culture, um, through its incredible urbanism. Um, so how we started is that the city itself is the result of all of these influences. I mean, it is a city of crossroads. Um, so how we can talk about the 
not just greater China, but across Asia and you know, including uh, the, the Western world, um, its artistic or design and architectural legacy or film legacy, all of that have fed into the uniqueness of Hong Kong. So where we are starting is also the jumping of, is the, is the historical uh, culmination or maybe crystallization is a better word, but also it is a jumping off point to be able to look at the rest of the world. I think one also benefit that we have at M plus is that um, we're not a national institution. If we were called um, National Museum of whatever, you know, uh, then, then, then there will be kind of state um, agenda that would determine our curatorial program, but because Hong Kong is not a nation, it is a city um, that has been historically really known as a very porous city, a city of crossroads um, has allowed us to be able to, uh, to focus on the city, but also look outside very, very easily. And then, uh, and then what is happening with its uh, governance structure and the sort of legal framework around it, that is literally what is happening on the ground here, um, is a challenge, but also that continues to make the city's standing um, more intriguing, in fact. Thank you. Um, Luli has a question which I feel in part has been answered, but just if you want to elaborate, um, how M plus is building its collection has prioritized the work of the Hong Kong diaspora, as well as from surrounding cultural and linguistic regions. You mentioned, of course, there's work by artists from across Southeast Asia, South Asia as well. But if you'd like to highlight uh, just as a last uh, response, how schematically, how extended that aspect is um, of including the diaspora and including the broader region within yeah. the collection building. I mean, it's, it's still quite schematic, <laughs> I have to say. And then I think that's just something that we talked about a lot and also talked to other very large institutions. Um, like MoMA or Tate Modern that have uh, institutionally made the decision that they are going to uh, have a global perspective. Um, and, but of course, global is not, it's never complete and never possible, really. It has, you have to have a particular stance to that idea. Um, you know, for instance, uh, like I'm most familiar with how MoMA um, develop its position in the last 10 years, that it decided that, that it's not going to try to canvas the world uh, because that makes no sense because the development of modernism itself is uneven. Development of modernities is uneven. So the whole idea of global and the, the kind of homogeneity that it suggests is in fact, um, it's a contradictory. So MoMA's approach, for instance, has been to focus on particular regions um, that the institution had some touch uh, relationships with, such as East Asia, with specifically Japan, um, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. And so I was part of that effort while I was working there. And subsequently, um, it's really MoMA's uh, research focus and acquisition focus in Asia shifted more to South Asia from East Asia. So like, you know, there's that kind of approach. And I guess our approach always has been as a young institution in its first decade, um, again, starting with that, that openness and porosity and perhaps confused identity, <laughs> um, confused, but very also specific identity of Hong Kong and its position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, both monolithic as well as the multifaceted identity of greater China. Um, one very conscious thing that, that we did is because how uh, in recent decades, recent years, Hong Kong is defining its identity is just so much overdetermined by its relationship with the greater China that institutionally and curatorially, we um, decided that 
we should actually say that Hong Kong is exactly first and foremost at the crossroads between Greater China and East Asia and South and Southeast Asia. And then that is a better reflection of it also being formed by historically the British imperial network. Um, and you know, the colonial legacy, of course, is a very important part of its history. And the, that also determines its affinities, direct connections, as well as diasporic networks from Hong Kong to the other former British colonies or um, the metropoles. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how we kind of started mapping the geographies. Um, and but it's a still the, the early efforts, I have to say, you know, and, and I think the last thing I guess I would say to that is that um, perhaps once we come out of this fog of confusion, um, then, then we will all be collectively questioning and really thinking about and looking back on our participation in the whole globalist discourse of the art world. Thank you so much, Dorian.